<laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This is Applied Statistical Analysis. This is our week 14 slides. It's a review week. Uh, this week, we'll cover a few things, including how to connect the dots, think about all the methods that we've talked about. Uh, there'll be some review questions in here that we'll be able to discuss here. And I hope that you'll be able to bring into the discussion on Canvas. So first thing we really want to do is connect the methods. So first thing is selecting the right method. So sometimes you're going to be able to select a method based on your research question. You won't have your data yet. You'll be able to decide what your data uh, will look like. Uh, and so you may just start with the research question. And so the research question usually can be split into two types. You can have a research question that has to do with looking at differences among groups. So if you think one group's going to be different than another or one type of person different than another, then that's usually going to be that type. The other type is relationships among continuous variables just like we have talked about with correlation. Uh, so when you have a research question that is actually asking about differences among groups, we're going to be looking at z-tests, t-tests, ANOVAs, chi-square, and regression. When it's really just about relationships, it's going to be correlation or regression. This, in my mind, is one of the awesome starting points as you're thinking about what stats to use. It's actually going to be based on what are my research questions? What's driving this research that I'm doing? As a reminder, z-tests, they compare a sample to known values. Not very common. We didn't go over it a ton in this class. t-tests, much more common. They can compare our sample to a known value. A population value, we can say we know what the normal population looks like. Is our group like that? We also have two independent samples or groups. That's when they are totally independent of each other, different people in each group. And we give them some, usually stimulus, or we do something different between them. Uh, we could do a quasi-experimental design, which ends up just looking at differences that are already a part of the, the individuals. So maybe one of the groups can uh, play a piano and the other one doesn't. So we have the two independent samples there. And then you have two paired samples, often time points, like a pre and a post. So you'll note that t-tests, except for the one sample t-test, in both of the other cases, it's always two, either two time points or two groups. When it comes to ANOVA, they compare three or more independent samples or groups. Uh, they also can do two. It'll give you the exact same result as a t-test. They can do three or more repeated samples, also two, but that'll be the same as the uh, paired samples t-test. But what ANOVA can do that's well beyond what a t-test can do is that it can do groups and repeated samples at the same time. This way we could do like a pre-post design and have a control group that doesn't have anything change and then a treatment group. When we are looking at ANOVAs, almost always it's going to be categorical things, categorical groups. So you have distinct groups that are independent of each other or you have distinct time points. When you get away from this and you have a lot of uh, other things going on, uh, like people are being tested at different time points, uh, they're not spaced evenly apart, then we're gonna need to look at other things other than the repeated samples ANOVA. So ANOVAs are always gonna be these very discrete either groups or time points, or the combination of both. When it comes to chi-squares, uh, those are going to compare one categorical variable to known values. Somewhat like our t-test, where we know this is what 
the group should look like, how many are in each, and we can compare it to that. Or, even more commonly, we can compare two categorical variables and see if they are related. So you have, like our examples, we have maybe a two-level group and a three-level group, and we compare them, see if, does it look like the two grouping variables are related to each other. And then the last one, but certainly not least, is regression. It can do one or more categorical variables. It controls for the effects of the covariates and can do even more than that. We talked a little bit about logistic regression, so that can even handle categorical outcomes. But a lot of what regression is used for is continuous outcomes. Uh, regression ultimately ends up being this really flexible approach that takes a lot from all these other approaches and can use them all. Notably, all but chi-square and logistic regression has a continuous outcome. This can be really important when you're thinking about what data do I collect. If possible, a continuous variable for your outcome is going to be your best option and it will give you the most flexibility in what you can do. But sometimes that's not a possibility. And with that in mind, you'll know the possible methods that you can use. When it comes to correlation and regression, correlation tells us the direction and magnitude of a relationship between two continuous variables. Correlation is almost always used with continuous variables. You can do it with ordinal variables too. And when you do that, it's what's called a Spearman correlation. In class, we really focused on the Pearson correlation. That is a correlation between two continuous variables. So correlation is going to tell us the magnitude of a relationship. Again, regression, it tells us the direction and magnitude in the units of the outcome of a relationship between two continuous variables. And then it also can do all the categorical stuff that we talked about on this slide. So I can have one or more categorical variables and tell us about relationships between the outcome and, and continuous variables. Here, all of them are continuous outcomes. So what we went over was selecting a method based on your research question, where you are going to collect data and you can decide exactly what kind of data you want to collect. And based on your research question, you can say, do I want to use these class of methods or these ones? Uh, sometimes though, when you come into a study, the available data is going to drive what method you use. The question, one of the first ones you need to ask yourself is, is your outcome variable continuous or is it categorical? This can just be looking at your data that you currently have and realizing, oh, it's continuous. So my options are Z-test, T-test, ANOVAs, or regression. Or we might find that as categorical ordinal or nominal, then we're talking logistic regression or chi-square. We also can select our method based on what we know about our independent variables. The question you need to ask yourself, is your independent variable or variables continuous or categorical? And not only that, but how many? Uh, if your variables are continuous, then you have regression and logistic regression options. If it's categorical, then you can use z-test, t-test, ANOVAs, chi-square regression, or logistic regression. You'll note through all of these things that we've done, regression keeps showing up basically on all sides of the coin, and that's because of its flexibility. So we can select based on the data we have based on our outcome, our independent variable, so many of you will have situations where you need to decide what method do I use for either my thesis or a research project. And so you have several ways to, to choose it. Sometimes it's gonna be all of these. You're gonna use your research question, the available data that you have together at the same time. Sometimes you're gonna be able to control one or the other. But I wanna give you these 
main approaches to actually decide what you're going to do. In my line of work as a statistician and a consultant, this is one of the first things I look for is what do we know about your research questions and available data to decide what are even the class of options that we actually can choose from. If all of our inter or all of our independent variables are continuous, then I'm not going to be thinking about t-test. I'm not going to think about chi-square. And conversely, if I know all of them are categorical, then I'm not going to be thinking about correlation. All of those things are going to help us uh, whittle down what we actually can use, and we won't have to waste effort on methods that we won't. Okay, so I want to give you a second to think about each of these questions. You can pause the video to give yourself more time. But question one, consider this situation. We hypothesize that test scores are caused by amount of time studying and note taking style. What approach could we use? So in a lot of these, there's not going to be just a single approach. But sometimes there's one that's more obvious than others. So one of the things that stuck out to me when I'm reading this is that test scores generally are continuous, so we're thinking continuous outcome. But we also are seeing two independent variables. So test scores are our outcome, and then we have time studying and note-taking style. Those to me sound, well, time studying sounds continuous. Note-taking style is probably not continuous. That means what we have is a continuous outcome, and we have a continuous predictor and a categorical predictor. So that information alone tells me I probably am going to pick regression because it can handle a categorical and a continuous variable together. Is that making sense? I hope it's helping to, to think through this. If you thought of another thing that might work for this, that would be a great thing to post on the discussion board and say, would this method work for question one? Because I'm not going to think of all of them, I'm not going to go through all of them either. Question two, we investigate the question of whether preferences for money or flying are different across degree types. So what approach could we use? One of the questions that you immediately need to ask yourself is, what kind of variables are these? Uh, the money or flying is categorical. They're either picking money or flying. And degree types is categorical as well. And so you need to think what approach works with two categorical variables. And in this case, we have chi-square. That's the first one and probably the simplest one. And then we probably could use logistic regression as well. This is one of those cases there's clearly two that could work for us. If we had other pieces of information for this, like we have covariates we want to control for, then it's going to steer us towards logistic re regression instead of chi-square. Question three. We want to know the relationship between poverty level, continuous variable, and teen birth rate continuous. What, what approach could we use? One of the things to note here is I was very careful about the words. I didn't say one was caused by the other or one was predicting the other or one was the outcome. So I said poverty level and teen birth rate. Often when we really just say the relationship and we're not really hypothesizing that one's the outcome and the other one's a predictor, we generally go with correlation there. But regression works as well because those two are related, they're built on each other. So you could do either one. But this one, because we don't say there's an outcome, correlation is probably a slightly better response. All right, question four. We want to know if our intervention regarding adult mobility works. 
we have two groups, intervention and control, and test both groups at pre-test and post-test. What approach could we use? So this one we have independent groups. We have two groups, intervention and control. But the twist is we also have pre-test and post-test, which sounds like repeated measures. The only approach that we've talked about in this class that can handle independent and repeated measures is the mixed ANOVA. In this case, there are other things that could be done, but they aren't things that we talked about in this class. So really for this class, the only one that would work would be a mixed ANOVA. All right, so that was section one of this review, being able to select the right approach. The second part, Another very important part is interpreting the results. Really the two things I want you to be able to walk away this, with this class is how do I select the right method and how do I interpret the results? When it comes to each of these methods, they have really common threads across each of them. Here we have a one sample t-test, the top one an independent samples t-test, the middle one, and a paired samples t-test, the bottom one. And you'll note in each of those, there's a test statistic. It's just a t value. All of them have a p value, and each of them have an effect size. And with t-tests, they all are Cohen's d. In the t-tests, the p value is always going to mean the same thing. If it goes below 0.05, that's generally our threshold where we reject the null hypothesis. That's saying that there is enough evidence for us to reject it. It does not mean that we're going to be right or wrong about that. It also is not the probability that the null is true. If you remember, the p-value is given the null is true. How crazy is this result? How far away is it? from what we would expect. That means a really small p-value saying it's really far from what we would expect if the null was actually true. So maybe it's not. And then the effect size with Cohen's d is just a standardized mean difference. That is, we put it in standard deviation units and look at how big the means differ from each other. And the general cutoffs are the 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 0.8. Again, those are somewhat arbitrary. One thing to note is that the negative doesn't matter. Uh, all it is is we're, we talk about the absolute size here. And then with ANOVA, we're going to see the same thing. We have a test statistic, a p-value, and an effect size. The test statistic for ANOVA is an F. We still have the same p-value. It's the exact same as it was before. And our effect size is now eta squared, which is in different units than our Cohen's d, but still it's trying to communicate a similar set of information. This top one is the one-way ANOVA. There's just one variable in it, it's race. And we're comparing differences across those. And here, p-value is not significant and the effect size is pretty small. So we would say there's not a significant difference the middle one is the repeated measures ANOVA. You can see that because, first of all, it says the name in the output in Jamovi. The second is talking about within subject effects. Uh, whenever we're talking about within subjects effects, there's at least some element of a repeated measures in there. In this case, it looks like mental health does change over time. The p-value is significant. I wouldn't expect you to know exactly what these variables mean. We haven't talked about that. But the idea is still the same. This variable is significant, and if it's a repeated measures ANOVA, then it's probably a time variable that it's significant across. And then you have an ANCOVA, which is uh, basically a regression model, just simplified output. Uh, the ANCOVA is just an ANOVA with a covariate in it. We haven't talked about that much in this class, but even if you came across it in your work or your career, 
we could note that it is still the same as what we're seeing with the other ANOVA stuff. We still have an F statistic for each variable. We have a p-value and an effect size for each one. And then the correlation matrix is really condensed. It just shows us a t-statistic and a p-value. But if you remember, the Pearson's art is an effect size on its own. And it can easily be converted to an R-squared effect size by just squaring those values. So the matrix that we see from the correlation matrix tells us the same types of information. We have a test statistic and a p-value. We just also have the effect size as part of that. And then with linear regression, our R-squared is the effect size. And in Jamovi, that's printed first, so that comes first. And then we have our model coefficients and we get some estimates. And we have, again, a T statistic. It's just a test statistic and a P value, just a P value. When it comes to linear regression, we do get this extra stuff. We can get model comparisons. We didn't talk about, about that a ton in this class. But what we did talk about was this estimate. And that tells us for a one unit change for the continuous variables like depression and mental aptitude, for a one unit increase in depression, there's a 0.04 increase in the outcome. For the race variable that's categorical, this first line, the negative 0.6952, is a difference between Indian Americans and Black Americans with whatever this outcome is. The second one is Mexican American compares to black Americans and white Americans compared to black Americans. In other words, it is just telling us differences or the change if we were to change that variable. Really, we only find these unique things once we get into linear regression. Up to this point, basically everything includes a test statistic, a p-value and effect size with regression, we get these other estimates as well. With that in mind, uh, this question five is interpret the following output. And I give you paired samples t-test. It looks like it's comparing prod two and prod one. We get a statistic here in the middle. We get a p-value and a Cohen's d. When it comes to a paired sample t-test, what we want to be able to interpret is the two major pieces. Is it significant? And is the effect meaningful? Here we would say the difference between productivity at time one and time two is statistically significantly different with a, an effect size of Cohen's D equal to 0.74, which is a moderate to large effect. This would suggest that we reject the null and the effect is meaningful. And then to put it into layman's terms, we would say people have changed their productivity from time one to time two. Next one, we have ANOVA output. We want to interpret this table. Let's say income is our outcome. And so this one would be, we used a one-way ANOVA to compare income across the races represented in this data set. There was not a significant difference between any of the races and the effect size was pretty small. And then in layman's terms, it's there didn't appear to be any differences in income across races in our sample. And then question 7.1 is interpret the following output. We have linear regression. What we're gonna interpret is that first box. We're going to go with model two in this case. That's a model with all of our variables in it, including this interaction that we'll talk about in a sec. And that model two, what we see is 
or r squared is 0.67, which is a big effect size. In other words, we're able to explain a lot of our outcome with the predictors that are in the model. To see what predictors are in the model, we can go down to the model coefficients down below and see the violent crime, poverty percent, and then the interaction between violent crime and poverty percent. All of those variables are significant predictors of the outcome, which is teen birth rate. And together, those three, if we go back up to the R squared, explain 67% of the variability in teen birth rate. And now, because we have a significant interaction in our regression, I recommend not looking at the individual estimates to interpret them, but instead to look at a figure to understand their relationship. And let's say this was our figure that we got out. So across the x-axis, we have poverty percent. The different colors is different levels of violent crime. The red is low violent crime. It's one standard deviation lower than the mean, which means low violent crime. The green is right at the average of violent crime. And then the blue is one standard deviation above, which means high violent crime. What we see is this interaction tells us for individuals in low violent crime areas, that's the red line, poverty percent has a high impact on teen birth rate. For just a small increase in the poverty level, teen birth rate goes up by a good amount relative to the other ones. Conversely, if you're at the mean of violent crime, Poverty percent still does look like it has an effect, but it's not nearly as strong of an, of an effect. But one thing that makes this output really interesting is the one SD above the mean for violent crime, the blue line. That line is the one that tells us that when you are in a really violent place, poverty does not impact the teen birth rate. You're just at a really high rate no matter what. As poverty increases, that line's flat, so it doesn't change the teen birth rate, which is not the case for when violent crime is lower for both the other levels. When you're in a really safe place, high poverty tends to really increase the teen birth rate, whereas if you're in a very violent place, it doesn't seem to matter. That's how I'd be able to interpret that. If it was on an exam, I would just piece apart each one. So I talk about the low violent crime place, what poverty, the relationship between poverty and teen birth is for that group. I would talk about it when teen, when violent crime is at the mean, and I would talk about it when violent crime is really high. And that would be a good interpretation, just walking through what each of those means. All right. The next thing that will be up is exam four. Uh, please post any questions that you have to the discussion board so we can talk about those before the exam. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, answering those questions and making sure that you are walking away from this class with a lot of good information, with the ability to select a method based on your situation and to interpret the results.